Hello and welcome to Narayana IS Academy. Students, I am Pratik, your faculty for daily news analysis. Now, students, as part of our daily news analysis, we shall be discussing five important topics from the Hindu and the Indian Express. So, let's have a quick glance of the five topics that we shall be discussing in today's session. The first article is taken from Indian Express, page number 10. This article talks about the terrorist attack in Raisi district of Jammu and Kashmir. The author of the article tries to highlight the challenges or gaps in our security measures and the preventive measures in order to prevent such attacks in the region. The second article is taken from Indian Express page number 11. Now this article talks about a grouping called G7. Now G7 meeting is likely to uh, be held in the coming few days and this article or the author of the article tries to highlight that this platform is going to give India many opportunities to deal with the challenges that we are facing. The third article is taken from Hindu page number one. Now, this article talks about uniform civil code. The representatives of the government are stating that a uniform civil code is still part of the government's agenda. The fourth article is taken from Hindu page number 12. This article highlights the fact that how the uh, all India service officers who are working in the state cadres are reluctant to join the center. And the last article is taken from Indian Express page number 18. Now, this article uh, talks about the Brahmos missiles and its importance to secure our defense mechanism. And the last we are going to discuss few practice questions which will help you to understand the type of questions that can be ask in the UPS examination. So students, let's get started. Students, the title of the first topic is redrawing the red line. Now, in this article, you need to understand the phenomena of terrorism, the challenges underlying it, and the solutions that we can think of. At the same time, the concept of non-state actors. And you can map this particular topic under GS paper 3. Right? So, Let's go through a previous question. The question is, analyze the complexity and intensity of terrorism, its causes, linkages and obnoxious nexus. Also suggest measures required to be taken to eradicate the menace of terrorism. This is the question asked in the year 2021. Now, for this question, you need to have a holistic understanding of the topic. So, let's get started with the context. The context, we all know that on Sunday, June 9, 2024, Jammu and Kashmir's Raisi district was once again plunged into grief. Why? Because this district was attacked by the terrorists belonging to the TRF, the Resistance Front. Now, this Resistance Front is an offshoot of the Lashkar e Toiba, and this particular terrorist group has uh, claimed responsibility of the attack, which led to the death of around 10 people. Now, Somehow we have this impression that the situation in Jammu and Kashmir is normalizing or stabilizing. But one event at times can upset the or spoil the apple cart of stability. And that's exactly what happened. It seemed that the situation is improving in Jammu and Kashmir, especially post the abrogation of Article 370. But somehow few incidents or few terrorist attacks has once again Put the region into news or highlight why because of the terrorist incidents. Now this attack specially coinc coincided with the India marking a democratic milestone. Especially on a day when the uh, cabinet was sworn in, that was the day the terrorists decided to launch an attack. And this is nothing but the strategy or objective of Pakistan to bleed India into thousand cuts. This is the state policy of Pakistan to bleed India into thousand cuts. So Pakistanis by supporting such uh, non-state actors, right, who are non-state actors, uh, they are the entities who claim that do not get this support from any government. But indirectly, they do get support from the government. For example, uh, the terrorist groups like uh, lashkar e toiba jaish e mohammad the resistance front all this can be termed as non-state actors right and they do get the support from the deep state pakistan now pakistan does not want the jammu and kashmir situation to be normalized so pakistan uses this jammu and kashmir situation 
or the uh, disturbance in the region to corner India or to put pressure on India. Now, whether the attack was aimed to disrupt the upcoming assembly elections in Jammu and Kashmir is something that we do not know. Why? Because the Supreme Court had set a deadline by, that by this date, the elections in Jammu and Kashmir should be held. Now, we have no idea if the attack was meant to prevent the election in Jammu and Kashmir, right? Which means in such type of attacks, it forces us, it makes us focus on the security measures so that we can reinforce our security mechanism. Now, despite the fact that significant events or efforts were taken in the recent past, for example, dismantling the terror financing or dismantling, uh, dismantling the networks of the overground workers, despite so, the pushback from Pakistan remains a deep concern for our country. Now, students, let us try to understand the challenges that why despite or after so many years and despite taking so many initiatives by the government of India, the problem still persists in Jammu and Kashmir. Now, one of the main reason is the persistent cross-border terrorism. The ability or the uh, objective of Pakistan to trouble India, to disturb the peace of India or to prevent India's uh, economic uh, upsurge. So, Pakistani state by supporting these non-state actors like lashkar e Doiba, they exploit these significant national events like let's say Independence Day, Republic Day or let's say the swearing in ceremony. They exploit such uh, significant national events and all this is done by the state of Pakistan or Pakistan's intelligence agency, the inter-service intelligence. Like India has raw research and analysis wing, Pakistan's intelligence agency is known as inter-service intelligence. The second one is changing tactics and locations. Now, the uh, terrorist groups or the militants have shifted their focus from the areas which were situated close to the line of control and they have moved far away from the line of control deep inside India's territory like Raisi, Rajori, Poonch, which are not close to LOC. And as the militants have shifted their focus, this is making our security forces difficult to anticipate the events like terror attacks and as a reason we are failing to prevent attacks. This is the second reason. Third reason is the complex terrain. Now this Peer Panjal Trail is a very difficult terrain. Now, this difficult terrain actually allows the militants to find an easy escape after attacking on the Indian soil. Now, this geo, uh, geographical challenge, it complicates our counter-insurgency operations and to boost our counter-insurgency operations, we would need resources and strategic planning. The fourth one is proxy terrorist groups who are nothing but groups like lashkar e Toiba, jaish e Mohammed, etc. Now, Pakistani state uh, intentionally uses this proxy group so as to um, so as to prove a point that Pakistan is not involved behind the attacks in Jammu and Kashmir, and it is these groups. The people in these groups are Kashmiri-based people, or they are Kashmiris. So, Pakistan by supporting indirectly supporting these people proves a point that we are not directly responsible, which means Pakistan tries to put the entire blame on India that the way India is handling the region, it is a consequence of that that India is facing so many attacks. Then the local support and overground networks. Now compared to 1990s, today there is no local support for militancy. But the overground worker networks and the ideological sympathizers is still posing a challenge to our country. These overground workers or their networks, they provide logistical support and intelligence for the terrorists or the militants. This is another challenge. The fifth is the public pressure. Now, such incidents like the Resi incidents uh, puts the pressure on the political representatives to take some quick action or immediate action. 
and we have to balance this with maintaining strategic stability which means along with uh, along with satisfying people's anger or giving response to the attack that india is facing by counter attacking pakistan we also need to ensure that we are not escalating the war right at the same time there is also public pressure on the government especially on the central government to uh, conduct the elections assembly elections in the region as soon as possible so these are some of the challenges now if you have to prevent all uh, prevent such rising terrorist incidences or attacks we have to focus on preventive measures like we have to enhance intelligence and surveillance we have to use technology to gather intelligence we have to strengthen human intelligence because a uh, human intelligence cannot replace any type of intelligence no matter how advanced the technology is no technology can ever replace human intelligence then we have to use uh, drones so that we can uh, monitor difficult terrains like the peer panjal range and monitor the terrorist activities the second one is we have to fortify our border security by enhancing border fencing surveillance patrolling along the line of control to prevent the infiltration and we have to uh, step up boost the security measures especially in the high profile events like the amarnath yatra then at the same time we have to provide specialized training for security forces so that our uh, security men the defense personnel can uh, can have the expertise in counter insurgency operations which means they should have the ability to operate in the difficult terrains or challenging terrains the next is community engagement and developmental initiatives we have to win the confidence of the people of jammu and kashmir without winning the confidence of the people of jammu and kashmir we are never we will never be in a position to eliminate terrorism right for example former prime minister atal bihari vajpay once said that to eliminate terrorism in jammu kashmir we need to implement three terms one is kashmiriyat jamhuriyat that is democracy and insaniyat that is human mankind then at the same time we have to also focus on developmental projects like we have to enhance the socio economic status of the people we have to provide jobs to the people so that we can prevent the youth from uh, getting attracted to the uh, terrorist elements or the terrorist groups so we have to create jobs and at the same time we have to hold assembly elections in jammu and kashmir to prove a point or to or to show our trust in the democratic process right and then court operations now wherever possible we have to undertake court operations so that we can dismantle the terrorist infrastructure and eliminate key leaders by launching court operations like we launched during 2016 the surgical strike right then we have to develop and execute calibrated military response such as targeted strikes on terrorist camps like we did in uri at the same time balakot so by maintaining a firm st stance on democratic process and enhancing security measures india can effectively counter the challenges that india is facing in jammu and kashmir i hope students you understood this particular topic students the title of the next topic is a reboot at g7 so uh, it is very important to understand this institution called g7 right and you can map this under gs paper 2 important international institutions right so let's go through a previous uh, question so these are the uh, names of the countries and which of the above are the members of the arctic council so similar such question can be asked they might uh, give you the names of the countries and might ask you the countries who are part of the g7 initiative so what is the context that the prime minister especially after winning the a uh, third term or becoming the prime minister for the third term will attend the group of seven summit in italy right now the prime minister's re-election after two terms has been positively received in the western countries right which means we have proved to the world that india is capable of holding elections at a large or massive level 
time and again we have been proving that how efficient our uh, infrastructure mechanism is to pull off such a huge election process. Now, interestingly, uh, our Prime Minister's reduced mandate has somewhat softened Western countries' concerns about the democratic decay in our country. For example, the Western countries were having concerns over the uh, the decay of democratic practices in our country or the way how democracy or the principles of democracy were diluted in our country. Now, given that uh, the current government or the BJP government has got less seats, this has in a way uh, made the Western countries understand that the Indian election process or the democratic process is very, very strong and robust, right? Then it provides, the G7 uh, summit provides a platform for India to reconnect and enhance our relations with the Western countries, right? So again, uh, this particular G7 is going to be hosted by the Prime Minister of Italy. Now, India has, especially the Prime Minister of our country, has a great rapport with the Prime Minister of Italy and this will definitely present India an opportunity to highlight our concerns and at the same time provide solutions for the ongoing challenges that the region as well as the world is grappling with. So what is G7? G7 is a seven of the world's advanced economies. We have Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, US and the United States, right? And the European Union is also represented in the G7 meetings. Very, very important for your pre-examination. Now, G7 focuses on discussing and addressing major global issues, including economic, international security, environmental and global health, right? So it uh, focuses on the core issues that the world is grappling with. Then it aims to foster collaboration and policy coordination among the world's leading democracies, right? Now, the G7 holds annual summits where leaders from member countries meet to discuss and coordinate responses. So, here, uh, the uh, representatives of different countries meet to address the challenges that the world is going through, right? And often, the summits end or result in the joint statements or initiatives after the end of the summit. So, this is about the G7. Now, let's try to discuss the dimensions that the author of the article has discussed in the article. The first one is the geopolitical dynamics. Now, the G7 summit will spotlight the growing conflict between the West, the Western countries and the Sino-Russian, that is the, the growing alliance or cooperation of China and Russia. So, on one hand, we have the Western countries and on the other hand, we have the China and Russian axis. So, you can also mix Pakistan in it. So, China... Russia and Pakistan access. The geopolitical tension presents both challenges and opportunities for the Indian diplomacy, right? So let's try to understand which are the challenges and which are the opportunities. Now, after this summit, this summit wherein we'll try to focus on enhancing our relations with the Western countries. We know that the Western countries have a problem with the growing access between Pakistan and China or Russia as well. Now, post the summit, our Prime Minister is going to visit Kazakhstan where the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit will be hosted. Now, SCO is an initiative undertaken by Russia and China. It's a geopolitical organization, geopolitical organization. India is also a member of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Right? Now, in the summit, we'll be engaging with the uh, premiers of Russia and China, right? So here, it is very important to emphasize the delicate balance India must maintain with the foreign relations or foreign countries. So it is very important that we, so we cannot side with any one bloc. Let's say we cannot side completely with the Western bloc and completely ignore our historic friendship with Russia. So that's the reason we have to find a very delicate balance in maintaining our relations with the Western countries as well as the countries in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So we have Iran, we have Russia and the Central Asian countries who are part of Shanghai with whom we have uh, good relations. That's the reason delicate balance is required. Then strategic interest. Now here we have to manage our conflict with China, cooperation with Russia and here we are also expanding our ties with the West. 
Now, all these things will actually test Indian diplomacy. How well India will be uh, or how well India will navigate through these challenges. The ongoing conflict in Ukraine, the Russian-Ukraine war and the increasing military tensions in the Western Pacific. For example, we have the South China Sea dispute. We have the Taiwan dispute. Right? Especially in the South China Sea, countries like Philippines, Malaysia, they have overlapping claims in the South China Sea. Right? So, India's participation in G7 will underscore its stake in deeper collaboration with the institutions of the collective West. Next is the regional and global engagement. Now, Italy's decision to focus on the G7's engagement with Africa and Mediterranean at the uh, summit will also open new avenues for regional collaboration between India, Italy and the G7. So, as Italy has... Um, approached to the African continent and the Mediterranean countries, India will also get an opportunity to engage with these regions and foster our relation with these countries. Right now, this specially approach of Italy, it aligns with India's policy interests in its extended neighborhood, especially the African and the Arabic countries. Now, the G7 summit will also address the relationship with the Global South, a priority both for Italy and India. Global South uh, it refers to the countries which are economically not developed, right? So, uh, the uh, Prime Minister of Italy has also requested or invited leaders from non-Western countries. Now, this will also provide or offer India an opportunity to engage with familiar and new leaders alike. So, here we are getting to or getting a chance to meet with the different countries and foster relations with other countries too. Rather than focusing completely on the Western countries, now, uh, focusing, relying or fostering deeper collaboration with the Western countries is a need of the art. That we cannot ignore. But by having deeper collaboration with the Western countries, we also need to focus or ensure that we are developing relations with other countries. So, we are not putting all the eggs in one basket. The point to be taken. Now, here again uh, in the summit, uh, the Prime Minister will get a chance to meet Pope Francis. Now, Pope is going to deliver a seminar on artificial intelligence, especially Rome call for artificial intelligence ethics. So, the ethical component in artificial intelligence which is missing, Pope Francis is, is trying to highlight or will highlight the importance of ethics in artificial intelligence. Then, food and energy security will be a major discussion point at the G7. Now, India is a major consumer of energy and a leading producer of wheat. So, India can make significant contribution in food and energy security also. At the same time, migration issue. Now, like many countries like US, Canada, India is also facing the migration issue. So, we can uh, have discussion with these countries to find a problem to the migration issue. Then, challenges and opportunities. Now, while this G7 summit will address the global governance issues like the Israel-Palestine conflict or Russia-Ukraine war, it will also focus on rallying the West to support Ukraine against Russia and counter Chinese economic challenges. So again, we, we are going to uh, experience more, um, more Western countries' apprehensions against Russia and China. Now, especially with Russia, we have good relations, right? So again, here we have to uh, navigate this relation very, very carefully, right? Now, the Prime Minister will not be attending the Ukraine Peace Conference in Switzerland, but the escalating tension or conflict in Europe will be significant concern for the Indian diplomacy. So, again, India will try its best to see how India will contribute to reduce the escalating tensions in the European region. Then navigating great power conflicts, this is what I had discussed now that again great power conflicts, we have the Western countries and the Sino-Russian axis. So here India should navigate this tiny or delicate relationship. So this time or India now is in a much better position, is stronger and better positioned to influence outcomes in the economic, political and technological arrays. So the world is expecting India to be proactive, right? Given that, given the stand that India is holding in the global affairs, the world wants India to take a proactive stand to reduce the tensions. So again, this upcoming G7 summit is going to 
give India a platform to reboot and strengthen India's relationship with the Western countries. At the same time, India's strategic engagement with major powers will be very, very crucial in navigating the complexities of the international politics. So, the Indian foreign policy has to ensure at the end that we are maintaining strategic autonomy. At the same time, we also need to ensure that we need to navigate through this difficult challenges very, very carefully. I hope, students, you understood this article. Students, the title of the next topic is Uniform Civil Code is part of government's agenda. So, you need to know what is Uniform Civil Code and you can map this under Prelims Polity or GS Paper 2, Polity and Governance. A previous question discussed the possible factors that inhibit India from enacting for its citizen a uniform civil code as mentioned in the Directive Principles of State Policy. We will discuss this particular topic. So, what is or the context is that the Union Law Minister has stated that uh, the current government will try to implement uniform civil code. But what exactly is uniform civil code? So, uniform civil code is nothing but it is the replacement of all the personal laws. For example, Hindus have their own personal laws, the Muslims have their personal laws, the Christians have their personal laws. Right? Now, for example, you have the Muslim personal law, the Hindu personal law. This uniform civil code is going to supersede all the personal laws, which means the personal laws won't be effective once the uniform civil code is uh, in effect. Now, these laws, right, the personal laws, they pertain to marriage, divorce, inheritance, adoption and maintenance. For example, there are different rules for different religions when it comes to marriage, divorce, inheritance, adoption, maintenance. But now, once the UCC will come into place, it will have a common set of laws, which actually is a good thing. The objective of UCC is to have a single uniform code that applies uniformly across all. The religious community. Now, what is Article 44? Article 44 of the Directive Principle states that the state will try, endeavor is try to secure for the citizens a uniform civil code throughout the territory of India. Which means the Directive Principle of State Policy of the Indian Constitution is directing the Indian state to try to put efforts to implement the uniform civil code, which will uh, strengthen the unity of our country. As of now, Uttarakhand and Goa are only two states having uniform civil code apart from, uh, so for example, when it comes to Goa, the Portuguese civil code of 1867 is applicable. That applies to people belonging to all the religions in Goa. Now, the government, it's not that the government has not tried to implement uniform civil code. For example, the government of India has amended the Hindu code bills so that the Hindu code bill can be or will be in line with the uniform civil code. Right? And then we also have Special Marriage Act to uh, implement the uniform civil Now, what is Special Marriage Act? Let's say, for example, a Hindu man and a Muslim woman wants to marry and the family is opposed to this marriage. Then these two people of different religions can register their marriage under Special Marriage Act. So, uniform civil code, now there is a dispute if uniform civil code should be uh, implemented or not. Why? Because we India is a land of great diversity. India is a plural land. There are different customs, traditions of people belonging to different castes, religions. So, we say that unity in diversity. So, with uh, following the diverse principles or by maintaining the diversity characteristic, we are also trying to find unity. So, you need in diversity. So, India is a diverse country. And in the di in this diversity, we are trying to find unity. This is unit in diversity. So, again, the critics of UC say that this might actually affect the diverse character of the Indian society. But no matter what, whenever the uniform civil code will be implemented, it should accommodate the concerns of different uh, religions or different uh, communities so that there should be no division in our country or there should be no disturbance in our country. So, UCC should not seek to homogenize cultural practices. The cultural practices should be allowed. People should be free to practice their own culture. 
so ucc should not homogenize the culture practice but wherever possible the uniform civil code should try to have a uniform set of laws i hope since you understood the uniform civil code topic students the title of the next topic is nominate sufficient number of ips officers for deputation says the central government so in this article you need to understand the all india service rule specialty rule number 6 and what do you mean by central deputation reserve and you can map this under gs paper 2 so previous a question was asked in the year 2020 so such type of questions can be asked in the upsc examination so what is the context the union home ministry has urged 24 states to nominate more ips officers for central deputation as of now there are significant vacancies in the central armed police forces at various levels from the sp level to the inspector general now students a uh, once you clear the examination you will be given a state cadre right so you will be serving the state but at times you also need to work for the center so actually you are deputed to the central government right this is what we understand by the deputation so you are working in the state on deputation now you are going to the center or working for the central government so what is central deputation reserve the cdr is the court of the all india services now who are the all india service officers the ias the ips and the indian forest service so these are the three all india service officers they are designated for the central government deputation from the state cadres as i told you you will be given a state cadre then you have to work for the central government and this is known as central deputation and this is governed by rule 6 now what does the rule 6 state that the all india service cadre may with the concurrence of the state governments concerned and the central government be deputed for service under the central government or another state government right but to work for the central government you have to work in the state for 9 years 9 years and then only you can opt for the central deputation so either let's say for example i i am an ips officer after 9 years i can opt for central deputation or based on my capabilities and abilities the central government can request the state i am serving in to release me so that i can work for the center so an annual offer list of willing officers is prepared by the states so in a state whoever is willing to work for the center the list is prepared and then the central government selects officers from that list this is known as central deputation reserve so it ensures that the experienced all india service officers serve in the central administration as of now these are the vacancies in the central government jobs but the practical experience being that the states are reluctant to send ips officers to cdr or central deputation for example let's say the central government says that i want this officer to work for the center the state government will not release that person that ips officer or let's say all india service officer why because loss of autonomy states feel that by allowing the ips officer right or all india service officer to work for the center they might lose control over these senior officers they might see that as this as the interference from the central government operational challenges the state governments they themselves are facing shortage of officers so the question is how can they send the officers to work for the central government the third is political consideration now if the governments at the center and the state is different then it's going to be a challenge for both these political parties or the governments at the center and the state the state government will try to resist the interference from the central government and for this impact on officers now this can also lead to the disruptions of careers of the all india service officers why because they are working for the state center this can affect their career progression i hope students you understood the article students the title of the next topic is brahmus has carved india's global imprint in defense arena so you can map this topic under gs paper 3 defense and security and uh, in this article you need to understand what is brahmus missile so question was asked in the year 2014 over agni 4 missile the characteristics 
So similar such question can be asked on Brahmos missile. What is the context that this Brahmos missile is a missile which was jointly developed by India's Defense Research and Development Organization and Russia's organization. Brahmos missile is recognized for its exceptional speed, high speed, accuracy and versatility. It enhances India's defense capabilities, especially uh, after its first launch in the year 2001. It's going to robust or strengthen our defense mechanism. Now, what is Brahmos? It is a long range, nuclear capable, supersonic cruise missile. All these terms are very, very important for your prelims examination. It's long range, nuclear capable, supersonic. It was developed by Russia and India. It is one of the fastest cruise missiles with a top speed being Mach 2.8, nearly three times that of sound. And with Brahmos 2, the maximum speed goes up to Mach 6, becoming a hypersonic missile. So it's a two stage. One is the solid propellant engine in the first stage. And in the second stage, we have the liquid ramjet in second. So all this solid liquid, all these terms are very, very important for your pre-examination. It's a multi-platform uh, missile, which means you can launch Brahmos missile from land, air and sea. And is a multi-capability strike with pinpoint accuracy working in both day as well as night. So it operates on the fire and forget principle. So you fire it and simply forget it. It will hit the target. Now the Brahmos missile's trajectory cannot be predicted so easily, which makes it difficult to counter the missile. Right? Now the range varies from 290 kilometers to 800. So range is also very, very important for your pre-examination. So what is Mach number? It is the ratio of the speed of object divided by speed of sound. This is how you get the Mach number. So uh, accordingly, the flight objects are classified based on their speed. For example, if, it, the, if the speed is lesser than the speed of sound, it's subsonic. And if it is more than the speed of sound, it is known as supersonic. Right? So here you see that uh, subsonic is Mach less than 1, transonic. So you need to remember hypersonic and supersonic. Right? So hypersonic is more than 5, supersonic is more than 1, and then subsonic is less than 1. Then about cruise missile. Now what a cruise missile? It's unmanned, self-propelled guided vehicle propelled by jet engine like an aeroplane. Right? So... They can be launched from multiple platforms like uh, land, air, sea, etc. Right? So they remain within the atmosphere for the duration of their flight and can fly as low as few meters off the ground. Right? So they are uh, again designed to deliver a large warhead over long distances with high precision. So these are few characteristics. I hope since you understood the article. Students, it's time to discuss prelims practice questions. The first statement, consider the following statements regarding the central deputation reserved for all India service officers. The first statement, the CDR quota is governed by rule 6 of the IS, IPS and Indian Forest Service cadre rules, which is correct. An officer must have at least 7 years. Wrong. It, they should have an experience of 9 years. The annual offer list of willing officers prepared by the states... And the center selects officer from the list. Yes, this is also is correct. So, 1 and 3, option A is the correct answer. Next is with respect to Brahmos missiles. It is a multi-platform missile, meaning it can be launched from land, air and sea. Yes. It is fueled by liquid propellant. No, it is fueled by liquid as well as solid propellant. So, this is incorrect. So, it is a long-range, nuclear-capable, supersonic, ballistic. No, it's not ballistic. It is cruise missile. It is cruise missile. And this one is incorrect. So, option E is the correct answer. With respect to Mach number, what is Mach number? The standard measure. So, please read these four options. So, it is nothing but it is the ratio of speed of the object to the speed of sound. And this answer you find in option 4. That is option D is the correct answer. Next is with respect to G7. Now G7 consists of Canada, yes, France, Germany. No, China is not a part of G7. Neither is India. The G7 focuses solely on the economic, solely on the economic policies among men. No, it focuses on 
economic, political, security policies, issues. So this one is also incorrect. The G7 holds annual summits to discuss and coordinate responses to global challenges. Yes. Recent G7 priorities have included addressing climate change and promoting global. Yes. So 3 and 4, which means option B is the correct answer. Next one is with respect to uniform civil code and it is mentioned in article 44. Very, very easy. It is mentioned in article 44 of the Indian constitution, the uniform civil code. Now let us try to discuss a means practice question. The question is discuss the persistent challenges faced by India in dealing with terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir and suggest practical solutions. Critically analyze how these solutions can be effectively implemented without compromising democratic principles and human rights. So students, you have to start this question or answer by the introduction. In the introduction, you have to mention that how despite uh, initiating few reforms, terrorism is still a problem in our country. You can highlight the recent attack on the Raisi district in Jammu and Kashmir. Right? And you can mention that uh, terrorism in um, Jammu and Kashmir right, is rooted in its history. Then challenges. Cross-border terrorism is a persistent challenge. You can mention the role of Pakistan's ISI in fomenting cross-border terrorism. The changing tactics and location which is far away from the line of control, right? Then complex terrain, the Pir Panjal range, you can quote or you can mention this example, the, the name of this range and how it provides an easy passage for the militants. Proxy terrorist groups like lashkar e toiba jaish e the resistance force supported by Pakistan, local support and overground networks. Though the local support has waned, but somehow we still have the overground workers and their networks who provide the logistical, uh, lo who provide logistical support and the intelligence to the terrorists. And then the public pressure that is of holding the elections, assembly elections in Jammu and Kashmir. These are the challenges. How do you overcome it? By enhancing intelligence and surveillance. That is by adopting the advanced technology like drones, etc. Border security by erecting the fences, right? You have to erect fence and then you have to uh, make sure that the uh, the uh, VIP places like the uh, Amarnath Yatra is protected. Then community engagement, you have to win the hearts and minds of the people of Jammu and Kashmir by again focusing on the socio-economic dimension. Court operations like we undertook in Uri, of the matter, Bala Court and then public awareness and security measures. So these are the solutions that we can think of. So again, in the conclusion, you have to mention that uh, instead of adopting uh, the measures in silos, we have to have a holistic picture, understanding and solution so as to overcome the challenges in Jammu and Kashmir. This is how you approach or write the answer for a mean space question. I hope students, you have understood all the questions that we have discussed and at the same time, you have understood, I hope, all the five topics that we have discussed in today's session, students. Students, please try to go through all these five topics and apart from this, try to read the other articles as well as uh, news in the newspaper so that you develop a holistic understanding of the ongoing events in our country. Students, if you want us to continue with our daily news analysis session, then please do like, share and support Narayan Ayas. Thank you so much.